In this episode of Unpacked. What do you see yourself as? I'm a white person. Am I my grand's child or am I now these white people's child? Have you ever dated a black man? No. Would you ever date a black man? A few years ago, I met a very fascinating woman and her story was so interesting and I'm so grateful that I got the opportunity to talk to her because sometimes I find we meet people and we have certain expectations about how they should be and who they should be. So for example, you meet a black person, you're gonna expect them to be speaking some native tongue or you meet a white person, you expect them to be speaking something else. Now today's guest is a wonderful woman who also happens to be in the entertainment industry. She's a young black female. However, she was raised pretty Afrikaans. Stay tuned. We have a sit down discussion with Marie Mulefe van Heerden and unpack her transracial adoption journey and story. Known as an actress and media personality to many South Africans, having appeared most recently in the film Hacks, she has graced the small and big screen in Gurenberg, Skuenma, Villaruesa, and Sievendelan, to name a few. Born in the 1980s, she was taken in by her grandmother, Maria Moatze, who lived in Ramakoka Stad in the Northwest after her parents were unable to raise her themselves. She was eventually adopted by the Van Heerdens, the Afrikaans family her grandmother Maria worked for on the farm in Rustenburg. This is her story. Let's unpack. Thank you so much, Marie, for joining us. Yes. I, I have to be honest. I mean, obviously, you and I worked together in television production. And initially, when I saw your name, I was like, oh, Marie van Heeren. Okay. That's a more pop-up name. <laughs> and then I met you. I was like, are you Marie? So maybe let's backtrack. Marie, where does that name come from? What's the background of Marie? Well, it's quite a long story, but to keep it short, my grandma, my authentic, real grandma, her name is Maria. Maria. Yes. Mm. So when I had to choose my own name, which is another story, um, we decided to take the A away from Maria and then it became Marie. What was the reason to take the A away from Maria? Well, my uh, adoptive parents um, told me that I could choose my name. Mm. I had a different name, which I'm not going to tell anyone. And so I was like, okay, I would like to be like Tatiana or something yes. incredible like that. And then my parents were like, Let's be real. Let's get yeah. you a normal name. Um, and we just decided, like, my grandma was so special to me and it was, like, her um, for, for making me adopt it. So it was her, like, her decision. So we decided, okay, something special. Let's give your name Maria to Marie. So I'm curious. I mean, let, let's take it back right to the beginning. Um, you know, the viewers that are watching at home already have an idea of what we're going to talk about. But I, I sometimes find like what I said is that we have expectations and whether your biases are negative or not, we all just naturally have some weird bias. And I think for me, because I've always been a creative, I'm quite liberal and open-minded, wasn't anything odd. But I know I've met a lot of people be like, how do you not know your home language kind of a thing? So maybe take us back to upbringing where you could actually be conscious of your memories, like the, your earliest memory, what, what was that about? Well, it, it's, it was difficult because um, I was the only black child in like in my primary school and um, I spoke Afrikaans and all the other kids were like, but you're not supposed to be speaking Afrikaans, you're supposed to speak a black language and I couldn't. Um, at that stage, my parents um, both spoke Afrikaans um, and it was, it was difficult because I couldn't really fit in anywhere. I wasn't black enough, but I was, wasn't also like I wasn't white enough. So it, it was hard. So if we take it back then, um, I mean, you already speak about your primary school experience. How did you find yourself being the only black kid in an Afrikaans school? What was that upbringing like? Because obviously, biologically, you are, you are black. You were born what? to black parents. What? what? <laughs> so maybe let's, let, let's start there. You were born to mom and tell us about that, that journey. Mom, dad, and you being brought into this world. So mom, dad, they were both teenagers um, and then... Whoops, I came out um, and my grandma just decided this is a 
toxic relationship. Um, I was busy dying and she had to find a way to, to keep me alive. So she was working for this white couple, um, Klaasie and Toy van Heerden, and she asked them, listen, can I please raise this child while I'm working for you? And they were like, of course, yes. What can we do to help you? So, so what area was that? That was in about 1986. So 86, and which area of South Africa was that? Because already when we think Tswana, you're thinking Mafike. It what? was in the northwest. Northwest, yes. all right. So all right. very mm. Tswana. Mm. Um, at that stage, my white family, they worked on a farm. Mm. They had a farm. So it was, you know, that type of culture. Mm. And it wasn't very <sighs> great to adopt a black child in that era. So, How did they get to a point where though they decided to adopt you? Because... Granny says, okay, I've got the situation. Please, can I continue to work but raise this child? I mean, obviously, it's natural. If children are in a yard together, they're going to be playing. But when does the conversation come where we say, actually, let's formally, let's make this the real deal? Well, um, my parents, actually, they were quite uh, open about it. Um, obviously, it's not like mm. they could hide that I was different. Yeah. Um, but they decided only when I'm... Um, able to understand what adoption means, then they'll ask me if I wanted to be adopted. So I was about, how old are you when you're in standard five? Like 13, yeah, 12, 13. 12, mm. 13. So they came to me like, okay, so this is the situation. You've been living with us since you were like two years old. We'd like to adopt you like legally. Would you be up for that? So I was like, yes, and I want to change my name. Great, thank you. <laughs> tell, tell us why, so, so here's what everybody will think. If you say, Gran was a worker to people that were working on a farm. Mm. You know, we're already thinking power dynamics, mm. financial dynamics. Mm. So, you know, share the picture for us. What does that mean? Were you still, you know, staying in the big room with Gogo, but during the day you got to play with your, your future siblings and then eventually it was like one sleepover. Like, h how did that happen? It was difficult because in the beginning... I was with Granny in the back room. Mm. Um, then we moved to Port Elizabeth. I think I was like, just like pre-primary school age. Mm. And then I lived in the house, but my grand still lived like in the servant quarters. So it was, it was weird. Like, am I my grand's child or am I now these white people's child? Like it was, it was awkward, but it, we just went with it. Um, I had a room, but my gran wasn't like a servant servant. Mm. She was still part of the family. She so just preferred to live in the servant quarters and I had a room upstairs. You know, so, so for, for me, the reason this is not odd, I mean, I've met a couple where, you know, they, they adopted the domestic workers' children and they lived in the house. The thought that kept coming to my head is, what, is, what does that feel like for a child where you can't articulate like what you say, mm. weirdness, where it's like, hmm, wh why at this time Gogo must leave and life continues, which South Africans might say white life continues, you know, privileged mm. life continues, but Gogo's still living so-called impoverished black life. Not, with our family, it wasn't like that. It wasn't mm. like she's uh, the maid and she has to stay away and she can't use our bathrooms or whatever. Yes. She was part of the family. Yes. Both of us were part of the family all the time. Her room was just downstairs. Yes. So it wasn't like, okay, we're going to eat now, so you need to go. Yes. Or you're relieved of your services. It was just like, okay, we all eat together. We all sit around the same table. And when we go to sleep, I go to my room upstairs and she goes to her room downstairs. It was, it was just like that. When did you have your first conversation, like real conversation about what you observe versus what was actually happening. Because I, I also find with myself that my perspective as a child was so warped because mm. you're like small, the world mm. is big, things might seem worse off mm. or more exciting than what, what uh, they, they were in reality. I think in my case, my brothers are way older than I am. Mm. So it was, it was, it was difficult to, to put myself in the family, meaning like, was I different because I'm so much younger than you or mm. is it I'm different because I'm black and you're white? Mm. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was weird. Like, I, I didn't really have a great relationship with my brothers at that stage because mm. the age difference. But um, I think around primary school when kids started to make comments, um, kids can be very mean. Like, they, they can be mean. And they made me realise like. Oh, so I am different. I just thought, okay, well, these white people just adopted me and it's fine. But they made me feel like, no, you're different. 
because you're black mm. and your mm. family is white. So, I mean, obviously when you live in a bubble, it's easy to not experience till you move outside that bubble and people say this doesn't look normal, right? So up until a certain point, like you're already expressing, there was a weirdness, but it wasn't really weird. When did you have that first real conversation that was saying, listen, things are all hunky-dory do in the house, but you must know when you go outside, X, Y, and Z is going to happen. Or did that actually never happen? That actually never, never happened. I think it was a, a too hard a topic to explain it to me. Um, and also I think for my parents, it was also too hard for them to understand and, and explain it to themselves. Like it was, we never had like, okay, listen, so um, people outside of this house are, are going to be funny. Um, I think also because from the get-go, I knew, like, obviously, I'm adopted, I'm different, and people are going to treat you different. Um, but we never had a talk, like a serious mm. talk. So, I mean, I'm sure somebody is listening going, if you were living with your mom, how come you didn't learn your language? You know, like, we, we're at a point where even um, in certain households of white families, they'll specifically hire a Zulu-speaking nanny so that their child can pick up another language. Mm. So... How would you respond to the people who say you should know your language, you should speak Sitwana? I should, but I didn't have the opportunity to. Mm. Um, mm. My gran, um, she learned Afrikaans when she started working for the Van Yerden family. Mm. So when I came along, we just spoke Afrikaans. Mm. Um, yes, obviously I picked up some things and she tried to teach me, but it was never like, okay, so you have to learn your language because it's important from black, like, but yeah. Is the Mulefe mom's surname, grand surname, or dad's surname? Mulefe is my dad's surname. Mm. Um, and I decided to keep it mm. um, just to always know, like, where you come from. Like, I could have gone with Marie van Yerden, mm. but I needed to feel like okay, I, I still belong in the Mulefe family. Mm. Mm. So now let's fast forward. You are developing as a teenager um, at that time, I mean, obviously a lot of people are trying to find themselves and get an understanding of who they are without even incorporating the creative side of you. You're in the school, you're the only black kid. Um, what is like going through your maturing mind? Are you an angry kid who's frustrated because you, there's certain conversations you can't have or are you just hunky-dory do in the bubble? I wish. No. Yeah. Um, I was, I hated everyone and I felt like, um, like the world owes me because why am I here and why am I black and why don't I have black friends um, or know anything about the black culture? Nothing. Mm. Um, I mean, like my own parents couldn't even do my hair because they didn't even know how to. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I always felt like the sore thumb sticking out um, and it, it sucked. Yeah. Um, people didn't understand me and I couldn't even understand me because like, I, I, I had no one to talk to or make me understand or help me because my life was white. Mm. I, the reason I'm, I'm saying it's so deep is because the, uh, from the outside, um, do, um, do you sometimes even feel that maybe people think you have a privileged perspective? Because, you know, when you speak, it sounds like you're almost a bit of a tortured soul, frustrated, mm. because it, it doesn't matter where you run, it's almost like lose-lose. Mm. But the perspective might be, well, messy, kind of a thing. I, I got it, like, when I, I think just, I think it was in varsity, mm. um, I can remember a couple of times, I'll go to, like, a convenience store or whatever, and the lady at the toll will speak to me in Zulu or Tswana or whatever, and I do understand a little bit, it's not like mm. I'm completely, you know, and then I would respond in English because I'm not that fluent. Mm. And then she'd be like, <laughs> like, don't try to be fancy. You can just speak Zulu to me. And I'm mm. like, it's not like I'm trying to be different. Just I don't know how to yeah. say that in your language. Yes. So yes. Um, from, from black people, I, I got that, like, mm, it's, she's trying to be better than us. Yeah. And then from, like, white people, it was more like, okay, well, but you should speak your language. Um, you should be black. And I'm like, oh, well, like, I can't win. Mm, mm. If, if we jump to, um, and we'll definitely come back to the chronological order, but if we jump to the question of identity, you know, I'm listening to you when, um, you know, like you say, if somebody tries to speak to you in Sizulu 
and you feel like I can't respond to you in your language, do you feel that Afrikaans is your language? If if you understand what I mean, Afrikaans is my language. Mm. Uh, I was I was born and raised Afrikaans. Um, I wish it was different. I really wish I could speak a different language or more languages. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm in my 30s now and I'm trying now mm. to, to learn. It's a bit late, but mm. yeah, I wish I, I did speak a different language. So, and I'm so glad you're expressing that because the perception is always you don't speak this because you don't want to or you don't um, okay. take the interest in learning. Can I stop you there? Yeah. I, when I was younger, I didn't want to. Mm. Uh, I was adopted um, and like I was taken away from, from my, my biological parents and I kind of hated them um, for just the, like the way they treated me or like the fact that um, I had to be adopted. So in my mind, I was like, I do not want to do anything about black people. I don't want to learn your language. Um, I'm going to be white now. I'm going to speak Afrikaans and this is me. It's just my skin that's black. So almost like a rejection, abandonment. Yes. Anger. Yes. So what would be interesting to me is, and, and I, I hear where, where you're coming from, is if we're saying, fine, I don't want anything to do with what you stand for or represent, because to me it represents abandonment, pain, mm. and I don't know what you guys mm. were dealing with. But you still have had Gogo with you. So mm. how did you mm. consolidate the fact that you're mad about mm. this, but you're living a different life, um, which some might say is a better life? How do you consolidate those two thoughts? I think in my case, it's weird. Through my eyes, I don't see my gran as black and I don't see myself as black. What do you see yourself as? I'm a white person. It's weird, I know I, I sound so, like. No, 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 and, 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 and it's, it's, it, this is the whole purpose of the show, yeah. is that we get to see the other side of it. Mm. Automatically when anybody says that, especially because everybody's getting all woke right now, mm. is for me to get an understanding um, of, like I know we've had a conversation where you say you live the Afrikaans culture. I mean, your man is Afrikaans. Yeah. But do you see yourself as black and white? And for you to say white, is that because of the Afrikaans upbringing or because there's nothing black that you can identify with? It's difficult because I don't identify as being black. Um, mm. Also, like I was brought up white, so I, I couldn't learn how to be black. So now, from the beginning, I was raised white. Mm. Um, I never had to learn how to eat with my hands, something mm. simple. Mm. Um, I always thought of marrying a white man. Mm. So I, I, I can't, it's not like I can't identify with, with being black, it's just I never learned how to. Mm. And I never had the opportunity to learn from black people. Mm. So mm. I'm white. I'm going to come back to this. Because I think there's maybe layers we haven't mm. delved into of you feeling like you're white and mm. also you feeling like Gran is not black. I'm going to come back to that, but I really want us to talk. We've got dad and brother here. Now, to remind all of you, when Marie speaks of mom, dad, when she speaks of, bro of my brothers, you actually are speaking of your white. adoptive family. Yes. Right? So we're going to be joined via video call with dad and brother of Pa in Booty. Yeah, well, um, what do you refer to them as? Uh, because I wasn't adopted um, from the get go, mm. um, they taught me to say, Wim Classy, mm. Tani Toy. Mm. So it was Women Tani. Mm. And that's how I learned. So I never, I've never called them like mom and dad. Yes, I got you. Yeah. But, but when you speak about but them speak to other my, people, they're my dad. You say and my mom. mom and dad. Yes. Okay, okay. Uwem, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to join you. Always a great pleasure to join anything that my children are involved in and to help them and uh, just to be with them. So I'm, I'm going to jump straight into the big question, which would say, you know, do you see, is for you, is Maria Marie, <laughs> interestingly, Maria <laughs> Marie, is she... Your daughter, for you, do you see her as your child? She's fully, fully, totally, fully my daughter. Uh, I, I, I don't speak of her, I don't think of her in any other way mm. than my daughter. Can there's you... no other way. There's, there's, there's no other way I can describe her. 
mm. or in my mind try to describe it. Can you maybe share with us the experience of Maria Mulefe, Grand? Gre, what was Grand's surname? Mwate. Mwate. So Maria Mwate, Mwate. Is, is working for you and she now is bringing this child to say, you know, I need to help raise her. Can you talk us through that experience? Yes, I, I will never forget it. I, I don't know whether Marie informed you that uh, that my first wife died of cancer. Mm. Uh, it's about 14, 15 years ago. And uh, when, <laughs> when Ositouna, we used to say Ositouna, Maria Molev, uh, Ma, Ma, Maria uh, uh, Ositouna. We, you, we call her Ositouna. And uh, because we all call each other Tani or Um, all the children on the farm and everybody, we talk about Um Klasi and I speak of Tani Elsa and, and that's all, that's how the children, that's how we, we, we were brought up our children. And when Maria came with Marie, uh, the first time, this little baby, she was, she was not even a year old. I think she was just about a year old. And she was, she had terrible malnutrition. Mm. And I will never forget it that my wife, my wife asked, asked uh, Maria, Oma Maria, she said, Maria, what are we going to do with this child? And Maria looked at us and she said, Tani Tue, Liebe Jesus, it for us here, can you Jesus gave us this little child. And, you know, um, I was thinking of it driving back this afternoon. Uh, uh, if anybody asks me that question, it, it's all about being obedient. It, 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 we had to be obedient. You can ask me about obedience just now. And we took, we took Marie in... Uh, Immediately, she was part of the family. We were still a whole family that time. Uh, uh, we were, all five, the sons were still in the house. And immediately, she was taken up because we were not brought up in a way of, um, of disliking people and not liking people. Uh, my children were brought up on the farm. We all lived together. We all worked together. And... They all played together. So there, there was no, uh, 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 there was no race discrimination among us. And it was immediately being taken up within, into the household. I could see it with my sons. Uh, and uh, our, our hearts were being changed as Marie grew into the family. Our heart we had to have our hearts changed. It was it was a big change. It was uh, it was a very difficult time in that time. Uh, living on the farm, living in the farming community, uh, uh, living in a difficult time, and <laughs> you know uh, it, it, it was. Um, it was a test we were being put through. It was a test. And, and we said, no, we're going to take this test. We're going to go through this test. We're not going to give it up. The Lord gave us this little child to bring it up, to give her schooling, to help her. And, uh, yes, it, it's just, um, I said to somebody this morning, I said, you know, the love that we have received from Marie and everything that we have just received. We, we had no, ever, ever, ever had any problems. We, we just had love. We just had, we just had blessings all the time. Mm. Um, I was thinking of it. We, we had some difficult times, uh, racist problems. Uh, and I'm, I'm so uh, glad you're people, jumping. I'm so glad you're jumping to the issue of race because I'm thinking to myself, if, it was 1986, 1987, that's pre-democracy. Yeah. And maybe on the farm, yes. 
You might have been a little bit isolated yes. from yes, my what, dear. what South Africa yes. was going through. So it was easy to be switched off. But when when you made the decision, like you shared, that you know she was a gift from God and you were going to yes. um, you know follow through and be obedient, was there ever a thought in your mind which thought, are we making a mistake? Are we compromising um, her future in any way? Was that ever a thought? And did you ever think that you would be having her forever? Or did you think we're just going to help for a while until, you know, mom and dad get themselves together? Yeah. You know what? Uh, a lot of people came to us. Family came to us and they said, uh, are you guys sure what you're doing? Or are you, are you definitely sure? And uh, deep within us, we had this assurance. We didn't, we didn't know that time what lies in the future. Mm. It's, it's like being in the COVID now. We haven't been in that situation. No people around us have been in that situation. We didn't have any help. We didn't, we, we didn't have any guidelines. Mm. What do you do in this situation? Mm. And we had, to write, we had to write the book. We had to write the book. There wasn't a book. We were writing our own book. We were writing our own story. And uh, yes, I, I do think that um, uh, sometimes the thought would come up, okay, are, are, we, uh, are we, is Marie going to lose something? I, I think the, the biggest mistake we made um, is, you know, we, we moved down to Port Elizabeth. And uh, when she had to start going to school, um, uh, we didn't know Koza. We couldn't speak Koza. Maria's uh, grandma couldn't speak Koza. The friends Maria's, uh, um, Marie's grandma made friends with were all Afrikaans-speaking people. Mm. And I, I think the, the biggest mistake we ever made was... Uh, that Marie didn't learn. I know she can hear Twana, but uh, she never learned to speak Twana. Mm. I think that is that is the one biggest mistake we we made. Uh, maybe some other mistakes. I don't know that Marie can talk about. Uh, uh, but we we tried. We tried. We didn't try. We gave her everything. We mm. we, we really poured out into her. Can, can, I, can I ask and, you a question? All, um, you, you, you're saying about, you know, that you made mistakes. And I think it's it's big of you to acknowledge because there is no guidebook to say this is, no. if, you, if, you, if you're adopting a child of a different race, obviously now we have access to more information. So the conversations are easier. Yes. And I think I understand what you're sharing a bit better. I would, I would love to find out from you. I mean, before you joined us, I was asking Marie, about how she identifies. And I'm curious to find out from you, how do you think Marie identifies in terms of her race? Yes, I, I, uh, I you know, I, I know at school, at school, people of our own race, of, uh, let's say of our own skin color, they gave her bigger problems mm. than any other people. And, uh, you know, they called her a whitey. And uh, they said, yes, you're a whitey. You were the white people. And and I know she she went through difficult times. I know she, when we stole me and my first wife worked in Spain, in London, wherever we were, uh, I, I know she had big problems with, um, with relationships. Because you mm. must know the environment she grew up was in a white environment. I'm, I'm going to pause you right there because I don't want to lose any of the good stuff, you know, especially to do with the relationship. So I want to take a moment to see, you know, let's jump and bring your brother on, right? And But before we jump and bring your brother on, is there anything surprising that dad has said that you didn't know? Um, not really, but I would like him to answer because he didn't really answer oh, your yes. question about how do you think, how do you think I see myself? Mm. Do you think I see myself as a white person or a black person? Um, 
I think sometimes, many times, I can see Marie. Uh, okay, let, let me put it this way. I, I see Marie more. I see her when I see Marie. Mm -hmm. We are in a white environment. Mm. Can I call it that way? But, but we you are see, in a she, white she's environment. Sitting, she's sitting right now with a, a fellow black sister. Because I see you, I see yes. black sister. Mm -hmm. Do you think when she's exactly. sitting with me, she identifies as black or do you think she identifies as white because of her upbringing? It doesn't matter whether it's a wrong or a right thing. I'm just curious of yeah. what you, how you think I, she I, sees I think, herself. I think she's, she's got a more, she, she, she more leans over to being, seeing herself as, as white. Mm. And that, that's fair I, then. I, 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 that's what I experience. That's what I see. Uh, this is what uh, uh, what I see coming out of her. Not 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 being ugly. Not being. But uh, sometimes I think Marie is. Uh, let me put it this way: that she is a a, a white person mm. in in a black skin. Uh, can I put it that way? That, that's sometimes how I see it. Not being, not being ugly or anything against any race. I, I don't think Barry has any race problems. So I would like to find out from you then, and I think you're, I, I can understand why you're struggling to answer it because it can almost feel like it's an, it's an offensive thing to say to somebody, you think you're white, but you feel trapped in a black body, right? But I, I would like to know from you, how would you like for her to identify? I mean, you know who she is, you love her, but you also acknowledge like what you say that um, you do wish that she would have, you know, for example, had access to learning uh, Sitswana. So how do you wish she mm -hmm. did identify while still being your happy daughter that you would like her to be? You know, uh, Lebo, I, I work internationally and I work with many, many different cultures all over the world. And, and to me, I think the most um, thing that we missed in our lives is that we didn't learn each other's cultures. I don't want to go down that way, but I can see Marie as she is being brought up in a in a white culture in a white house mm -hmm. with her grandma being a Tswana. Mm. I can see her that she is she's adaptable. She adopts to adapts into any in any culture she can adapt in. And that's what I see in her. I, I, I think she I think what what comes forth out of her what she does in a, and the way she can adapt is the way we've been we've been living in long before long before. Uh, 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 so so, so let, let me ask you the harder the, question. The harder question would be, if tomorrow you know because I've dated white men, and I've had a very multicultural yeah. upbringing, and yeah. in my multicultural yeah. upbringing. I still acknowledge that I'm in an interracial relationship and I still can be pro-black as a black woman, right? Yeah. While choosing. Yeah. But I think it's yeah. a different thing if a person says, I identify with white and I'm dating a white guy, maybe because that's what you know, which for you, you are dating your own kind. So in almost like if you dated a black man, that for you would be an interracial relationship. Yes. Mm. Yes. Definitely. Mm. Have you ever dated a black man? No. Would you ever date a black man? No. Why not? Uh, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's, it's the skin color or the black, it's just the culture. So what if you met a guy who had a similar upbringing to you? Very similar, similar story. Grew up in the farms, has, was raised in an Afrikaans household, doesn't know his home language, or maybe does, but is quite, you know, rich in... Afrikaans um, culture. I think it would be weird for me. Why? This is this is the part I'm trying to understand. Is is does the black still represent your parents 
either not being good enough to parent you or you feeling like you were not good enough for them to choose you? I think, yeah, I think it's, it's leaning more towards me not wanting to identify with being black. Mm. So now dating a black person goes against that feeling. Mm. Not that I'm racist, obviously, I'm not mm -hmm. racist. Um, it's just I was brought up being white and in my head I'm white, so I'm going to date a white person and, or, or, or like a, a culture close to me, to mine. I don't know, I don't know. Does, does your boyfriend think, does your boyfriend hmm, refer to you as a black woman or because you identify as white, it just is somewhere up in the air. I think it's somewhere up in the air. So he's never said, yo, yo, my girlfriend's black. Like if he's like, my girlfriend's on the way, Marie. Yo, Marie van Hidden. He doesn't like give people a heads up. By the way, she's black, guys. It's just like everyone sees you and they're like, oh, and keep quiet. Um, no, well, in the beginning it was like, oh, okay, so I'm dating a black girl. Yes. Um, but now... We don't even talk about it. We don't. He doesn't mention it because I don't think he, just like me, like sees me as a black person. Mm. Yo, I've got so many questions. Hey? <laughs> so let's let's do this, Pa. We're gonna we're gonna come back to you in a moment. I want us to talk to your brother. I just okay. I, I just want to come back to that one. What Marie said now. I, I I've been watching them, and there is nothing from George's society. Is nothing like that. There is absolutely nothing like that. What Marie said. Nothing. Mm. And uh, I, I can be up for it because me, me, me as a father that brought up, uh, we've been thinking of this. Uh, whether she's whether she met a Greek guy or whether she met a Nigerian guy or whether she met a Thai guy or whatever, the person that was to be sent to her to to meet up with her. I don't think it has anything to do with color. I think if 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 the right if the right Thai guy or the right Nigerian or whoever came along the way that she had to meet with, uh, they would have met up. Uh, then there was no color thing, nothing. Not as it is now. There is no color thing. I think the that's, the, that's how I see it. the color thing comes more from my side. I actually was just thinking that. I was thinking to myself. When people are watching this, it's almost going to feel like, actually, while the perception might be, hmm, something's up with this Afrikaans family, the question might be, are, are you still battling some internal things, which I, we will get to. For, for now, Ba, we're going to come back to you. I want us to talk to your brother. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you mentioned earlier that you've got five brothers. I used to have five. You used to have five. Yeah. Why are you used to? Um, my oldest brother died in a motorbike accident. Okay. I was okay. two or three years old, so I okay. didn't really know him, but yeah. And what was the age difference between you and the four brothers? My youngest, I'm now 34, mm. and the closest one to me is 45, six, So it's so an 11-year difference. Yeah. Like, okay. we never actually grew up together. They mm. were way older than me. So who are we going to be talking to? Well, Quibus. Quibus, this one. This one died. So yes. the oldest one now. Oldest one. Yes. All right. But we're coming back to you. Don't worry. We're coming back to you. We're going to talk to Kuebis. Okay, so Kuebis van Heerden is also joining us via video con. He's at his own place. And I think it'll be interesting to also get that perspective. But is there something that Paul said that might have surprised you? Um, not surprised, but more like heartfelt. So um, I'm glad that I could have brought anyone home. Yeah. Like he said, I could have brought a Nigerian home or, yes. or whatever, and he would have been fine with it. Um, but I also think, like, not, not, not to speak for him, but in their minds, I think they'll be fine. They'll, it would have been better for me to bring a white guy home. Okay, okay. So I we're going to be joined by older brother, Gubis van Heerden, who joins us via video con. Hi, Gubis, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. So you are... You sorry are, about that. Um, the hat, no problem. I said sorry about that because I'm, I'm just hiding my hair, you know. Nobody's had a haircut since uh, 52 days. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe talk to us about your experience. Um, you are the second oldest brother uh, to Marie. Yeah. You, you, by the time then that you came into the family, you were a teenager. 
Um, I was, when she came in, I was first year university. Oh, wow. So you are now approaching yeah. uh, uh, early adulthood. What are your earliest memories of yeah. Marie joining the family and being a part of the family? I can just remember when her grand brought her to us and she put her in the kitchen. She was this tiny little, tiny little thing, very thin. You could take it, the inside of a toilet roll and it could fit her whole leg through it, through the inside of a toilet roll. That's how thin she was. Very, um, yeah. So we fell in love with her. <laughs> and um, you... We just you, cared for her, yeah. You, um, I mean, Marie mentioned earlier that obviously when she was growing up because of the big age gap, it wasn't necessarily love and get along at first sight. What was the experience for, for you? I don't know how she had it because we, for, for us, she was just this tiny little thing. You know, um, we were five brothers. We never had a sister in our life. And yes, suddenly we had this little, and she was fantastic. We had, we played with her. I, it's all I remember. You know, she, she was just joy in our house since she got there. She brought, because I don't know, my dad didn't mention it because just soon after she came, my oldest brother died in the car accident. And then, yeah. It was a very emotional time in our lives, and uh, she was, yeah, you know, things changed, and um, yeah, we loved her very much. Still do. So, so how do you feel about the fact that, um, I mean, Marie's coming into almost like that seven-year cycle, you're approaching 35, mm. and um, uh, the older we get, we're trying to find ourselves. How do you feel about, yeah. you know, how she identifies as an individual or is it not even a thought that crosses your mind? No, it does. I mean, I, since she was small, I used to talk to her about a lot about it because I knew that this would come up one day. I used to encourage her to, she needs to go visit her parents. She needs to go see um, her grandpa grandparents' parents because they're still alive in the farm. I always encourage her to go there because I told her, I always said to her, you need to know who you are. You, you, because you are part of our family, you will always be, but you are also part of a different family and you need to know who you are for your own good. So would, would it surprise you to know that Marie identifies more as a white person than she does even a black person and would probably not not likely date a black person that um, um, at all, whether they had the same upbringing as her or not? I don't, I don't know. I think, I think, um, I don't think that is a true reflection. I think she's, she, she's been, um, she identifies white people because she grew up with them. It's not that, and she, I don't think in her life so far, she had the opportunity to spend as much time with people of different color, perhaps, because of the way she was brought up and in, 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 in the groups that she mixed since she came from school, you know. Uh, it's just, I guess, it's just who you are when you, the people you hang around with. And it's, it's not by choice, it's by the way she lived and who she became. I, I, you know, it becomes difficult. That's why even when she went to visit her family, always where she came from, it was it was difficult for her when she get when she goes there because, you know, here she spent ninety percent of the time with us, and then she goes there for a little bit. She could never really identify with them, which is just a natural occurrence of the way that life happened and her time was spent with us. Which I don't think it's a, a race thing; it's just time. So. How would you then respond to the person who would say, you know, there's lots of children around the world that get adopted. And um, yeah. when you get to a certain age, you can make decisions, for example, about the circles you, you yeah. are in, about the people you have in your life. Um, how would you respond to those people who would say, actually, no, she should be doing this or maybe... You know, you might walk out and say, I just want to be myself. It doesn't, I don't feel I have to learn Sitswana mm. or I don't feel, maybe you, you feel pressured to learn Sitswana because people are like, hello. No, um, you know, when she, when she was here in, in primary school, my parents were, um, a lot of the times they were away um, on, on mission trips. And then it was just me and her and her mom at the, at, the, at, the, at the house. And my other brothers were then studying other places. And so, I mean, I know it was Marie 
when she made friends at the school, that, that's the friends she made with. And it was not, not never a, a race issue. It's just friends, people she connected with. You know, it, it never became a race issue. And we, and we never kept her from any other races or speaking to other races or making friends with them. It's just who she identified with, the friends she made, you know, the connections she made. And uh, I, I don't think, uh, I think where she is now, she's still got a, a wonderful life ahead of her. And she is now, because she's become a sort of celebrity, she will now be mixing with more with people of her own color and, and in, the, in the places where she's joining. And that's going to be good for her. Yeah. I am, I'm looking forward to see what's happening to her. I always keep my eye on her life. I know she's going to be a huge success. I have to say, I really admire the love your family has for you because, like, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking the, the biggest sense I get is that they just want you to be ha happy and they just love you as you are. Is that a sense that you've always felt with your family? Always. Um, I mean, I do remember the, like, like what Koba said, like, when we used to live together, like, I, he was like my big brother, he always used to tell me what to do and what not to do and always help me. Um, and even in school, I can remember my parents were like, they were never like too hard on me or like you have to get A's and you have to do all the mm. sports. They were never like that. They, whatever makes you happy, just be yourself and just be happy. Can I ask a hard question? Yes. And you have to be fair, Gwibis. Do you think that, hey. that your parents, your s same parents, <laughs> were actually kinder to her because you were the younger one or because you're the one who came in from a very difficult situation? Do you think they were easier and kinder on uh, you than they were if you were a <laughs> biological child? Um, uh, let me ask you that. My dad always wanted a girl and he never got a girl. We were five brothers and he suddenly... So she was very spoiled. I mean, she got things... We were the five of us who had one car that we shared. She had her own car. She had her own motorbike. She was spoiled. <laughs> and, and now the, 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 viewers at home don't, the viewers at home don't know that before, you know, we started shooting, you know, all of us, myself and the crew, we were listening that you guys actually just speak Afrikaans. You're literally only speaking English for us. Yes. So if, if, yeah. my, if my Afrikaans can be better than than ons. <laughs> yeah, my Afrikaans ended in standard yeah. five and that's that's where it ended. But you actually speak comfortably all the time in Afrikaans. Yeah, Afrikaans is my first language. Yeah, it's just it's just it's just the way we are. I mean, she was part of our family. It's just you know, when you are interact with family, you just talk and you love each other most for who you are. You know? That's just how it is. I just want to answer the question that you asked um about did my dad or my parents favor me more. Yes. I, th I don't think it was more of a, f like, favoring more. I think it was more like protecting me from the outside world. So rather stay here mm. and get everything here than go outside because if you go outside, people might be rude to you and we don't know how to deal with that or understand yes. it. So it's almost like your upbringing was sheltered. Yeah. While the intentions were yes. right, you might not have actually been properly prepared for the real world yes which is now dealing with people going huh yes not understanding the bubble that you came from <laughs> okay i think i think i get what you guys are saying <laughs> before i let you go buddha yeah. um i would like yeah. to find out how do you feel about i mean i know she's got a man because i see her in facebook and tra la 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 -ti da i mean how do you feel about the fact that um she's got love in her life and it might not look like a picture you might have imagined for her? Or maybe this for you was the most natural thing? Well, um, she waited a long time, you know, and she she dated other guys, but she never got really serious about anybody. And she, in her 30s, she only got, she met George. And I'm happy. I'm, I'm, I actually said it's time for them to get married, you know. I'm, I'm years <laughs> so much I said pressure. that guy should start paying. He should pay La Bola. Oh my and I God. want a piece of it. <laughs> Lobola. Are you guys going to accept Lobola? Actually, now, now that I think about it, if she does get married, are you sending cows to, to are you? No. So you don't, if, if your family, no. would you include your biological family in the proceedings? Only my grand. So if your grand says we need to do things the proper and acknowledge culture, are you going to say no? Yes. 
Is it because you don't agree in the practice of, of Lobola or because you're not trying to practice a culture you weren't raised in? Both. Both. Uh, it's not my culture and <laughs> really, cows and me, you... <laughs> No. <laughs> How cows you... represent wealth. They represent so many things. And it doesn't have to be cows. It can be gold bars. It can be money. Yeah, but then I don't yeah, believe... I also said, you know... You just want the money. I, I just don't believe, like, in buying your wife. Okay. No, I, 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 I get you guys. I feel like we could talk for years. Buddha, I'm going to let you go, but thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything you want to share with me? I love with... you. I, I, yes, one thing I want to say, I'm very yeah. proud of her. And I know I know she's going to be hugely successful. I always told that from the beginning. Everything that she did, she did well, you know, with no pressure put on her. I mean, when she did sports, she became a, a, the top of the sport she could she do. When she did, when she studied um, the, the sport science, she did very well at it. And yeah, and everything she, Marie does, she just puts 100% in it. And that comes from her family side. I, I wish she could find out, she can get to know her grandfather and her grandmother. I mean, even though they, they never had the opportunities that she had, they always, when they were working on the farm, they were that kind of people. They put 100% in everything they do. And that's where she, she gets it from. She, from. From us, she just got the opportunities. But who she is comes from, from her, from her uh, genes. Thank you so right. much for talking I mean, I to us. I really appreciate your openness and honesty, of course, to come to the conversation. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish you the best of luck. And of course, I'm, I'm feeling the love that your brother has for you. I really am. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. All right. So before, you know, we get to chatting about some of the things that, that brother said, mm -hmm. let's get some words from dad. Bar, thank you so much for waiting so patiently. It is my pleasure. So it's my pleasure. And, uh, we we, we spoke on. to Gwerbis and he had some loving words for his sister. And um, I'm just wondering, I mean, is there anything about your experience that you'd love to share with viewers, especially viewers that um, may have been in the same position where they've adopted a child of a different culture, because there's lessons you've learned that you know now that you could advise them on. I've been thinking about this very much, and I, I, I just want to, what Kuba said and, and about Marie and about a, a grandmother, the five boys and Oma Maria. You know what Oma Maria brought up my five boys. She brought them up. She, she was there. She was the one that played with them. She was there because my wife was uh, a, a teacher at school. Uh, I was farming and the boys were there. The, I think why, why this whole thing mixed up so well is because Maria was taken into the family. She was part of a family. She was not, not a, a child working for us. She was part of the family, because we make people part of the family, because we are, are all God's people and we are all, we are to respect and to love all people. That That is what, because I'm being a Christian, I'm talking out of a Christian heart. This is what the word tells me. He says, the word says, respect all people. You have to respect all people. This is what the word says to me. And you have to love all people, love all mankind. And I think this is this is what makes it a very, very, very big difference. We we didn't we didn't take Marie in to be somebody in high places. We we just normal people. We we also near like Afrikaans mission. We are we are not even middle class. It's people. like uh, rich, rich, right? So yellow's knee right off yeah, the main say so yellow. We 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 not we're not rich people. Mm. We we don't of these people that said, Oh, you know what? We adopted the little child and look what we did. Mm. We did this out of the love for God and out of being obedient and taking this girl in, into our hearts, taking her and doing what God expects of this, expected of us to do. And I think this is this this is what brought the whole thing together. Whether it's black or white or what it is, 
It, it never made a difference. I never spoiled it. Kuba said I spoiled it. The people were talking to me and they said, but, uh, you know, you can't do that, Marie. She said, you, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to be. Uh, I'm not going to be different with her than I've been with the boys. We never went to the school and said to the teachers, "Oh, you know, we're our little girl this and that." She had to fight her fight. She, she, as small as she is, there, she's a piece of dynamite. So let me. And uh, she fought the fight. In essence, if I understand what you're saying, you are saying that for anybody who wants to go into, into, you know, feels that they have a calling to adopt a child who happens to be of a different culture, it's raise your kids the same, love them as you would your own. And, you know, exactly. you, you are coming from a Christian perspective of to say, you know, respect everybody. And for me, I always say, you don't want a destitute child because while there isn't a black family to take you, it's like you want a child to have a home. doesn't matter what it looks like. Um, if I understand correctly, yeah. that's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I've always wanted me and Marie to get to sit down, and I wanted to write a book. I wanted to write a book, how to adopt a, somebody of a different race. Uh, mm -hmm. I, she, she's got so much knowledge to do that. She mm -hmm. has. She has. She has it within her to help other people, not me. She is the one that experiencing being adopted into a different race. And I actually think the, the why that's the, the biggest reason that I wanted us to have this conversation is because it's so awkward mm. to have the conversation that I wanted it to be open and hopefully that somebody can learn for the, from the experience. And of course, having your family yeah. here means the world as well to get their perspective. Bye, bye, donkey. Thank you so much for chatting to us. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Lina ki ale boham. Lina ki ale boham. Rale boha, rale boha. Sala sentle. So dad has challenged you to write a book. What do you say? I say it's a great idea. Um... I must just get in the mindset of, okay, it's okay to be adopted and people knowing that you're adopted. Because um, obviously I would love to help other people um, not go through the hardship I went through and to make it easier for other people. What is your current relationship like with your biological parents? None. As in they are around still, but you don't interact, you don't Pay, play an active role in their lives and vice versa? Um, the problem became uh, when I was just started in the entertainment industry. Um, I got calls and messages from my real parents saying, oh, but you need to come back now. Started seeing me on TV and, you know, people in TV are very rich. They've got so much money. So now I have to give money to them. Mm. And I th that just made me angry. Um, mm. You couldn't raise me or didn't want to raise me mm. when I was a baby and vulnerable. And now that I'm in a position where I did well for myself, now you want me. And now I need to come back and now I need to pay for stuff. Mm. Um, so I just decided, you know what, I'm not about that life. It makes me so sad to hear that. And I'll tell you why. Um, I've had issues with my parents, obviously for completely different reasons to what you do with yours, but I value them playing an active role in my life beyond just being the biology, you know? So the thing that makes me sad, and I hear where you're coming from, is that um, while you have your dad and your brothers, that I feel like, is there something that you are missing out on by not having your biological parents actively in your life? Or do you feel like, no, forget the biology, they actually are toxic and I don't need them in my life? But who decides what is perfect and who decides what you need? And mm. who decides, oh, you, sh you actually need this and you're missing out on this? Mm. Who mm. says I missed out? Yeah. Um, maybe I had the, the, I had the best life I could have had. So not even missed out per se. For me, it's more about 
you sharing that right now you don't have an active role with your parents as an adult. What's happened in the past, that, that can't change. And obviously, like you say, only you will know what is right for you. I think my, my perspective, because of my relationship with my parents, I can only speak from, wow, I, I feel that rich connection. Do you ever feel like there is something missing or do you feel like there's really nothing missing? They're not adding value. There's really nothing missing because I did have a mom and a dad. Mm. I also had like uh, two people who brought me into this life, but that was their role. Mm. They, that was their role and that was enough. And then I got actual parents. Mm, mm. Do you um, have any siblings, biological siblings? I do. I have a younger brother. Same mum, same dad. And what is your relationship with him? Also, same. Um, I can't even remember the last time I spoke to him. Mm. Um, he, I think he lives with my real mom. Mm -hmm. And my dad apparently has another daughter with someone mm -hmm. else. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, I just distance myself, like, you have your life, mm. I have my life, and it started when I was two years old. And Gran, what's relationship with Gran Maria? Gran, good relationship with her. I speak to her almost, uh, like, every third day or once a week at least. Mm. She is still in my life, and I, uh, she doesn't work anymore. Um, obviously, she's mm. a bit older, and I take care of her. Um, mm. Whatever she needs, um, I pay for her. Um, what does she feel about your relationship with your parents? Um, she would like me to go visit them um, only for the fact that they are harassing her mm, for about many you. years. Mm. And they feel like, and only recently, that she stole me, mm. which is not true. Mm. Um, and that's why she wants me to go back and explain. But I don't feel like I'm, like, I don't feel I'm there yet where I can go confront them or, like, speak to them because I might just say hurtful things. So let's say hypothetically. Yes. Mom and dad are watching. Yes. What would you say to them? And you can say it here or you can say it to me. What would you say to them? Thanks for bringing me into this life. And I really hope things are well with you. Um... Please stop harassing me and my gran. I'm not going to give you money. Um, and I really appreciate for what you did that one day. Mm. And that's it. We skipped over the part of the relationship. Tell me a little bit about, um, I mean, without delving into the intimate parts, um, but you already mentioned you're comfortable um, you, in a way, you don't see it as an interracial. You're like, we're same, same, mm -hmm. same WhatsApp group. Mm -hmm. Is that still how you feel when you are in the outside world, outside of your bubble? I, it's weird because George, he doesn't see what I see. And maybe it's just in my head. And but you I mean in the world in the or world. in so the now, relationship? No, no, in the world. So mm -hmm. now we're outside and I can see people going, mm. or whispering or saying stuff. And I don't know if, if it's just me. My insecurities that's, that, that makes up these stories, or is it real? Like they are talking about this interracial, interracial couple, because he doesn't see it. He doesn't see people behind our backs talking about, I'm already dating a black girl. If you were saying insecurities, what would you say? Like if you were to vocalize what those insecurities are, what would you name them? What would you call them? Um, I'm insecure about a lot of things. <laughs> I'm an actor, so... You're okay, that too. <laughs> um, uh, um, I'm insecure because I'm not white enough. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not black enough. And I, I don't fit anyway. I'm super short. That mm. <laughs> So it's, there's a lot of th little small things that just makes up this... <sighs> state of mind where I am at the moment. What did you, do you think would bring you to a point of comfortable, content resolution of, you know, the subject that we're talking about? What, what is it for you that could happen that would make you say, whew? Age. Age. I think. Um, I, 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 like, I can remember when I was younger, this feeling was way worse. And um, it was way harder for me to make friends or, or excel in everything because... 
I, I've always had felt like I had to be perfect, you know, because mm. I always already have these, like, I'm black, I'm short, I'm mm. different, I'm loud, I'm whatever. So I always try to be perfect. And, like, the older I got, I realised, like, it's okay not to be perfect. Mm. It's okay to be black in a white family. Mm. It's okay to be this. It's, it's okay. Um, obviously, I, you get those days where you're down and I, like, you go back in that mm. little bubble that you are. But I think age, the older I get, the, the, the more I accept myself. I hope that you do get to share your story in detail. I mean, I literally feel mm. like we skimmed the surface mm. of, of a richer story that maybe we, we really could all learn from without even have to, having to be adopted or to adopt. And I hope that um, you can express it in a way that can be healing mm. to you. You know, like... There's, there's some things that I got goosebumps so many times talking to you, like, you know, with your family, with you. And there's some things that um, I can't help but feel like they need healing. Mm. And I, I can't even say to what that mm. is, but I feel there's some things that require healing and I hope that you get that. What would you like to say to everybody watching at home about anything that you would like them to know? Um, just be yourself um, and why you do that, accept other people for who they are and what they are and it doesn't matter how they look like or um, how they feel like um, to themselves, um, just love each other. Let's leave it there. Just love each other. Marie Mule Fair Fun here. And thank you so much for joining us. I think this was such an insightful chat. And I came in thinking I know some stuff. And I'm like, wow, I, I don't know that much after all. But thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And it's just a pleasure. And I hope I could help someone out there. There you have it. Um, I'm sure you've got a lot more questions. Of course, you can check out our social pages and our social details. And even if you have questions for Marie, you can also check out her social pages. And maybe, just maybe, we'll be lucky enough to get a sneak peek into that book or that movie or that series or that documentary. But I hope that for you, we got an opportunity to unpack this particular unique South African story. Thank you for joining us. From myself, Freddie Bukhile Mabocha. Next time on Unpacked. I was a boy mm. and I like other boys. When and how should a trans person come out, so to speak? And should they? I'm this person that you see now that has transformed into a woman and now I'm really a woman. Politically, I identify as a trans woman. That's Unpacked with Rilebukhile Maboja. New episodes weekdays at 5.30 p.m. on my YouTube page. Don't forget to subscribe. Television edited broadcast weekdays at 5 p.m. Open up with S3.